introduce Ala this morning. She is a labor and delivery nurse and birth doula. She's currently a travel nurse getting the chance to explore the country doing what she loves. She supports birthing people in both hospitals and in home birth settings. It's an honor for Ala to help women align themselves spiritually, mentally, physically, and emotionally as they bring new life and enter new beginnings. In the journey of rebirthing themselves, her goal is to help create a space for women to feel safe, empowered, and confident to make the choices that serve them best. She wants pregnant people and those who are and those who are not to know about their options in childbirthing and how to prepare to claim their full power from pregnancy to labor to delivery and beyond. We welcome Allah this morning and uh, take it away. We've done our little tech check and we should be good to go. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen real quick. Okay, so I'm going to go in between uh, sharing my screen and then coming out of it so that you could have the full screen uh, presentation of um, just myself because I, I only have about 20 minutes, so I don't want to get too much into um, too in depth with the with the slides. But thank you all so much um, for having me here. It's an honor to be joining you all lovely women for this very important conversation. Um, thank you for your attention and energy. And especially after listening to Dr. Pimentel, thank you so much for your wonderful talk and very educational and inform informative discussion. Um, and it's definitely, I definitely took plenty of notes and it's added to my repertoire of knowledge. So thank you so much for that. Um, so yeah, I want to be speaking from my lens um, and weave in my experience as to um, what this conversation is about today. Um, my hope in the, about the 20 or 25 minutes we have together is that it is filled with, that this conversation is filled with perspective, engagement, and community of understanding one another. And I have no doubt that that would be the case. Um, so yeah, besides me being a labor and delivery nurse and a doula, let me go back just a second. I can stop the screen share. So if I stop the share, you have me back full face, right? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so besides me being a labor and delivery nurse and a doula, I come from parents who are immigrants from a country in Northeast Africa um, called Sudan. And um, my parents grew up telling me many stories of their upbringing and their childhood. And my mom told me stories of women who had passed away due to childbirth or pregnancy related causes back when she was growing up, whether it be in her village or in school, or even some of our family members with one of our uh, family members recently passing away about two years ago um, from pregnancy related causes after she gave birth to her second child. And I remember when my mom used to tell me these stories and I'd be like, and me being here raised um, in America, I would say, okay, yeah, that's sad. And like, that's really unfortunate. But prior to ever entering nursing or the medical system itself, um, I just, I just chucked it all up to that. There's just no technology, right? Um, the lack of resources in, in Sudan, why would they um, be able to save every single mother when there's an emergent obstetrical event? But now that I've entered into the system of medicine here and the, the birth work in hospital settings and in home birth settings, it's been eye-opening and shocking to see how um, our system is not protecting women and more specifically black women, which is the focus of our conversation today. And so I'm left asking myself, like we work, we have the best of all, best technologies, resources. We work with, we have the smartest people um, in these rooms dealing with um, any sort of issue that might arise in childbirth and pregnancy. But here we are still dealing with the reality of the fact that 60% of maternal deaths in this country are preventable. And I think Dr. Pimentel mentioned that. Um, and this is ridiculous in a world where maternal deaths are actually trending down, especially in developed nations. So what is happening and why, right? The answer lies in the system. And I, again, just picking back off the previous wonderful educational presentation we just went through, the answer lies in the system, right? So I'm just gonna go back and just talk a little bit about some terms that I feel like we all probably know already, but I just wanted to make sure that we're on the same page. So we have a term here, implicit bias, and that is related to um, 
Implicit or unconscious bias operates outside of the person's awareness and can be in direct contradiction to a person's espoused beliefs and values. What is so dangerous about implicit bias is that it automatically seeps into a person's effect, affect or behavior and is outside of the full awareness of that person. Implicit bias can interfere with clinical assessment, decision making and provider patient relationships such that the health goals that the provider and patient are seeking are comprised, compromised. So that's what implicit bias is when we talk about that. I'm gonna briefly go through social determinants of health. So social determinants of health are defined as conditions and environments in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and act and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. And then the last definition here is systemic racism. In the US social determinants of health, disproportionately affect people of color. And so that's why I went through the definition of social determinants of health, which are these factors that are involved. They affect people of color owing to systemic racism and policies dating back to the country's founding that has been directly or indirectly discriminatory under design and or implementation. In turn, these policies have led to pronounced racial inequities in access to quality health care and education, food security, safe housing, employment, and more, and ultimately producing racial disparities and health outcomes. So that is what we're dealing with here. So now when we look at these terms, we're like, okay, now we can probably see why Black women are three to four times more likely to die of pregnancy and childbirth-related causes than white women, because we see that systemic racism is at play. And again, it's crazy how much um, our previous speakers um, presentation aligned with what I was going to be talking about, but I also wanted to mention that before we even address Black maternal mortality, we have to talk about Black health, right? Because we know that we need healthy people before we even have healthy pregnant people. For instance, I'm someone who has never had a child before, but I know right now, before I go ahead and have a child, I need to make sure my health is in, is in play. And I also need to be aware of what is the what are the factors, the social determinants of health that are going on around me that are at play. And so, you know, for instance, if I were to tell you that, you know, black people experience food insecurity three times more than their white counterparts, you know, would it surprise you to know that a good amount of black women in birth are probably not eating the most nutritious foods to support their bodies in pregnancy before they even conceive, right? So these are all things that go much deeper than one can see. I just mentioned to a coworker the other day, I said to her, you know, um, I was talking about the, I don't know if you guys have heard of the new Hulu, Hulu documentary called Aftershock. It just premiered last week. And it's a really good documentary you all should check out if you can, please do. It's only about an hour and a half and it's amazing, okay? And it goes into depth about pretty much the stuff we're talking about today. Um, and I mentioned to her that, you know, black women are dying at higher rates than white women are. And she was like, well, is it because they just don't go to their doctor's visits? And I was like, no. <laughs> and then I had another coworker who used to work in Georgia because as a travel nurse meeting different people around the country. And she said to me, well, you know, I asked her specifically, I was like, Georgia has some of the worst rates in the country. Why do you think this is happening? I mean, you work with black women all the time at the bedside. And she was like, I think it's their diet. And I was like, no. <laughs> so these are conversations I'm having with people who I work with at the, who I'm, you know, with, at the nurse's station, station with. And these are the same people telling me that the reason is because of diet and because they're just not going to their appointments. Um, and so, I'm going to go ahead and talk about my nursing school experience just a bit. So back when I was in nursing school, um, I had a feeling I was going to be in, in labor and delivery. Um, so I was very much excited for my OB course. And I really adored my teacher. I thought she was really good, my professor. And one time I was in class and I always used to record my lectures. And in class, I remember I was kind of tired that day. I just worked. I was working full time and then going back to school for nursing. And um, I was sitting in class and I thought she mentioned something about like black women feeling uh, less pain in breastfeeding than, um, than uh, uh, yeah, black women, sorry, feeling less pain during breastfeeding than white women. And I remember being like, nah, I'm just tired. I didn't hear that, right? So I, then I go home and I'm listening to my lectures, like studying for my exams. And I was like, wait a minute, she did say that, you know? So I had to go back and address it with my nursing professor, you know? And this was in the year of 2016, 2016 or 20, 2017, when I had confronted her and I was like, 
this is crazy. And then I kind of went, went ahead and told her, well, this is the information about how black doctors believe that uh, black bodies are feel less pain, right? So we had to have those kind of conversations. Back then, if I had known what I know now, I probably would have been more adamant to tell her, hey, can you go back and rescind that? Can you go back and like say it and like state it over again in class the next time? But to me, that conversation I had with her was enough, right? I was like, it's fine. I told her what I told her. She said, sorry. She like told me she didn't mean it that way. And then we had a conversation. And in my mind, that was enough. But looking back, if I had known what I had known now and what I had, what I know now, I definitely would have been a lot more adamant on um, asking her to just please correct her statement and to make sure that everyone was aware of that correction. So I wasn't able to fully grasp that right back then. But now I'm thinking about it and I'm working with women and I'm realizing, you know, there, I don't know if you guys know that um, Black women are less likely to um, breastfeed their babies, right? The initiation rate is very low um, for Black women, 60% initiation rate. And uh, continuation at six months is only at 28% and 12 months, it's 13%. So compared to all the racial and ethnic groups in the US, black women fare the least and less likely to breastfeed their baby. Um, so I'm thinking, okay, we're in nursing school. I'm literally, and all these people around me are gonna be the future caretakers along with the future doctors and the future everyone's, right? And here is what is being taught to me right in my face. And where is she getting this from, from a book? And who produced these books? Who who's who is in charge of the information that was compiled in these books? You know, then you go back to what again the previous present presentation was about, and how we all stem from the father of gynecology, and everyone's like, oh, the sim, sim, sims, and it's like. Do you guys know what this guy even did? And similar to what Dr. Pimentel mentioned, I had to go back and do this research all after, right? This is information that I've only been able to uncover since about 2020 or so. And it's amazing to me that so many people of my peers that I work with still have no idea what I'm talking about when I say to them, yeah, three to four times more likely. They're like, what? <laughs> No, like, but I'm not racist. I'm like, yeah, but that's not the point. That's not what we're talking about. Right. So there's a lot of conversation that goes behind all this. And it's a lot, it's not as easy um, to deconstruct it, right? In a, in a country where we're we're moving forward and um, a country where we believe that we have the resources to move forward. And I absolutely believe that we do, but we also have to address what has happened in the past um, in order to move forward. So um Again, it's not because Black women are poor, because of their diets, because of their family structures, because they don't have good health insurance. Um, someone like Serena Williams had to keep telling them that something was wrong with her after she gave birth to her child. And that she did not have bad health insurance. I'm pretty sure she didn't have a bad diet. And I'm pretty sure she was well taken care of and other aspects of her life. Um, so I'll go into talking a little bit about my uh, nursing school um, from my journey as a labor and delivery nurse to becoming a doula and to what I'm doing now today. Um, so when I started working as a doula, that was back in, sorry, as a nurse, um, I did labor and delivery nursing specifically back in July of 2019. And then that was several months um, later is when the pandemic hit. And um, I remember during that time and similar, again, I keep referring to this, but I feel like we keep repeating like similar timelines as to what Dr. Mimentel was talking about. But I felt very, during that time, especially with all the racial um, injustice that we've already known that's been going on, but that was very much in our face um, being um, talked about in the media. I was very much moved by you know, feeling like, you know, well, what am I doing, right? Like, what am I doing just sitting here coming to work and taking care of these people and feeling, feeling like there was something more, feeling like I wasn't being taught something, feeling like something was missing. Like my intuition told me something's not right here. Something's going on. Like, I don't know what to do. And I'll try to talk about it, but none of my coworkers seemed to understand. And I felt I was alone. Um, and I deep down always knew I wanted to be a doula. Something about being a doula always enticed me. And I was like, I need to just do this thing. But it took me a while to finally get my foot in the door. So finally, in February of 2021 is when I decided I wanted to become a doula. And that took a lot of like mental, um, it was a mental challenge for me because I also wanted to continue my work at the bedside in the hospital, but I also felt like I needed to do more because I felt like when I would see women come in through the doors, I would only meet them right there in their labor. And I felt like I had some of the tools to be able to talk to some of these women way earlier, you know, in their pregnancy so they can better be better equipped and prepared to deal with what's going to happen. Um, and I feel like 
you know, with everything going on in the system where doctors are increasingly charting more, um, nurses are increasingly charting more, everyone's just in, you know, um, kind of going by protocols and systems that hospitals have put in place. I felt that I wasn't able to fully support my patients the way I wanted to. Um, so that really hurt me inside. I was like, there's something wrong with this, you know? And so when I went back and did my doula training during like my third week of doula training, I remember I had a breakdown, like a meltdown. And I was like, I'm just going to quit being a nurse. I'm going to just be done with nursing. I'm going to just go ahead and open up a full-time doula business and do this thing because I really felt moved and felt like it was more like, um, um, a way to kind of, it was kind of like a radical movement, right? Let's bring, let's figure out, you know, how to beat this. Like, let's, let's break this down. But then I had to realize, well, the system is a system and there's a way to kind of work through it while being there um, and trying to like find ways and points of intervention as much as I can in order to help mitigate anything that I might see, whether it be from other nurses or from other doctors. And so that was definitely a journey of like understanding within myself that I'm a birth worker. It doesn't, and, and it can look in the role of a nurse or a doula or maybe a midwife in the future. But at the end of the day, I know that I know within myself why I wanted to do this work. And I wasn't going to let the fact that systemic racism and structural racism and everything that comes with everything, right? Just because we are in the United States of America, I had to just do what the best, the, the best I could do. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about why someone might be interested in a doula. And I feel like this is like a new thing that people have been discussing more and more lately, especially since 2020. But um, doulas improve birth outcomes. That's why <laughs> that's why people should get doulas, right? Um, so doula assisted mothers are four times more likely to have a low birth weight baby, two times less likely to experience a birth complication involving themselves or their baby, and they're significantly more likely to initiate breastfeeding. Communication with and encouragement from a doula throughout the pregnancy may have increased the mother's self-efficacy regarding her ability to impact her own pregnancy outcomes. And so that's really what it is about doulas. Doulas are really there to help mitigate those risks and help to step in as an amplifier of the voice of, a, of another woman or a birthing person in that room. Because I'm telling you, when someone's walking in, and I'm just saying, I'm just I'm just thinking in the, in the perspective of a woman who's just coming in for the very first time, a woman who may have never been in a hospital until they had a baby. Maybe they were born in a hospital. Maybe they had like a few visits, you know, at a hospital. Maybe they had like an, a, an infection when they were younger and they had to be like overnight or something like that in a pediatric um, situation. But then later on in life, they probably as an adult have never really been in a hospital. And a lot of times I'm like starting people's IVs and I'm like, is this your first time getting an IV? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know? And I have to remind myself like this is their first time just in this setting. And this can be scary, right? This is the first time that women are allowing themselves to be so vulnerable it's a, such a huge milestone that they're going through. Um, and here we are just like so used to it, right? The system, the protocols, the policies. And the doula is there to be that constant support, that constant person who could be at the bedside, just amplifying that woman's voice saying, hey, remember we talked about this, you still want that, right? Hey, um, I think that person might be trying to pressure you to do something like an intervention that is probably not necessary. And let me tell you what the risks are of doing something and what they're not, that maybe they're not sharing. And this is just the reality of what it is. I've, I've seen enough situations happen in the, at the bedside where I see where doulas are, um, rooms where there are doulas are, seem to be approached differently. Okay. As far as, um, being able to discuss um, something with the mother and knowing that she has a doula at the bedside, knowing that there's someone else there who's not in labor, but who knows what's happening alongside her that can, who's, who doesn't have any allegiance or anything to the hospital, right? Um, so there is a big um, um, need for doulas because they are, they can break down these walls, right? They can break down the system. And um, I feel like, you know, doulas help to, buffer what the medicalization of birth has become because birth has become so medicalized i don't know if you guys have ever heard of the uh, business of being born it's a documentary that came out a while ago i saw it in college um but it's a very incredible documentary about the medicalization of birth in this country 
um, and how much it has changed, you know, especially with the progression of having granny midwives who have come over as enslaved women um, who have come and taken every, you know, their knowledge from back home in Africa. And then now slowly but surely white doctors, white OBGYNs are pushing them out. The white male doctor were pushing them out. And um, slowly but surely um, midwifery care and doula care was kind of falling at its seams, right? So now we're trying to talk more about midwifery, about how in different countries, like in, in the UK, um, doulas are, um, midwives are, attending a large majority of births, right? Versus here in the US, it's OBGYNs who attend the large majority of births in the hospital settings. Um, and so, yeah, my hope is that our experience in this country regarding childbirth um, can become more balanced and more hands-off, that moms are more hands-on and not giving power over to the system all the time. Um, and I, I, my hope is that people can become more educated about their options as they decide to figure, you know, what route they wanna take with their pregnancy. Um, and that um, basically my hope is that people can find their footing in the system and not let it just fall into them, onto, you know, whoever's laps they end up you know, um, being in. So that's my, that's my hope. And I'm going to go back again. Sorry. And I hope the switching back and forth isn't too much. Um, let's see. I have this beautiful poem that was written by Dr. Albert. She is the, the president of the Association of Black Cardiologists. And um, I'm just gonna read it to you all. Um, I am fierce, I am furious, I am fibroids, I am fertility, silent screams, silent screams. I am finances, I am stressed. I am superwoman, I am shamed, silent screams, silent screams. I am subtle, I am silenced. I am dismissed, I am discounted. Silent screams, silent screams. I am hidden, I am pained. I am my ancestors. I am strength. I am maternal and non-maternal. The black maternal health crisis encompasses black women and people without children too. Silent screams, silent screams. We need not die. So yeah, there's so much I wanted to touch base on and I just wanted to make sure that I had enough time for any sort of reflections, questions, um, anything that anyone wants to talk about, because I know I just touched about on a few different things and I wanted to um, allow space for that for anyone who wanted to speak. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. That was wonderful. We really appreciated that. Can you um, give a brief description of what your doula training consisted of? Sure. Um, so my doula training was, there are several different ones. Um, some of them are like weekend workshops. Some of them are like, they, they are like over the course of months and weeks, weeks and weeks and, and some months. So my training was about six weeks long. I felt comfortable with that because I was already in labor and delivery. And um, it was a course every Sunday, it was three hours. And then we also had homework groups. And it was this woman um, by the name of Lathan Thomas who was the um, head of the organization called Mama Glow based in Brooklyn, New York. And it was a beautiful, beautiful training. She did a lot of um, like healing um, trainings because she knew that this work was radical. And um, she also did a lot, we focused a lot on the things that I was never taught. And that's when I had those breakdown moments because I was like, how am I doing this every day? And I didn't even know all this information, but it was such a, um, it was such a good training. Like it really left me feeling rejuvenated and ready to take on um, what needed to be taken on. So that was the doula training. It was great. And I still am really good friends with so many of those women. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, uh, thank it, you. For I, I think that it's, you know, when you shared the piece about the information that was being shared when you were in school in 2016, that was, that's, you know, it's, with everything we've heard today, I don't think it's a shock, but in the same time, it also is a shock that that's still, it's, you know, still happening in 2016, that that's still the messaging that is happening. And, um, I just appreciate your lens and your experience and, and you bringing light to this. And, um, obviously there's, there's been a lot of progress, but a lot of work still left to be done. Um, 
And that's, that's pretty wild. Um, I think I shared this last time, Ala, but we do have at DEMIS, we have put a, some considerable funding from SAMHSA into supporting doulas in our pregnant and parenting programs. Um, and with our Reach and Proud programs as well, so that folks can access that support, um, because we do know that a lot of the individuals we serve are so vulnerable, and then that additional layer of advocacy um, and just empowerment to be able to trust yourself, I think, can be so important. Um, and so we really appreciate it, you taking the time today to give us your lens as well. We have a question from Macau. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I'm just curious if um, I really liked what you said about working within the system to change the system. And I'm wondering what kind of trainings you would like to see nurses have to change the system from within. And I'm curious if you are familiar with the Lamaze program that brings hands on uh, comfort measures training to nurses? Yeah, so, okay, that's a really great question. Um, if I could bring about uh, trainings to the hospital setting for nurses, I would love to see trainings on this topic, especially kind of like exactly what Dr. Pimentel just went through with us. Um, I think like that information will help shape the the um, will just help, help like widen the lens of what people already don't know. Um, and, and I think a lot more, I, I don't want to, I don't know if I want to call it like implicit bias training, because that's a part of it. I think some of that would be good. But I think a lot of it would have to be dealt with more on like the race, like the structural racism type piece, because I feel like that's the part that's a little bit more difficult for people to kind of work through. It's, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, and yeah, I've heard about the Lamas training before very briefly, but I've never, we, it's never been something that um, is like offered in the hospital setting. We only get offered like certain types of training and some of these trainings are so important. And I don't know why, you know, it's kind of like, well, why can't we get that, you know, Lamas training? Is the Lamas one the one where you're teaching women to just like birth on um, medicated and kind of go with what your body, what your, what your body naturally is doing? Is so Lamaze has the arm where they teach women and it's based on six healthy birth practices now and um yeah a lot of it is following your uh you know following what your body is telling you to do and um not birthing on your back being in having freedom of movement so there are the six healthy birth practices that are uh, how Lamaz frames its childbirth education program for birthing people. But then Lamaz also has a track to train nurses in the hospital on hands on comfort measures. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, training that's similar, well, I don't want to call say it's similar, but spinning babies is the one that most nurses have heard about that they do offer and in for us in the hospital. So it makes it easier easier for us to attend those trainings. But yeah, um, I think a lot of nurses too um, are, we're kind of used to just, um, again, back to the medicalization of birth. We don't have a lot of training on um, like hands-on comfort measures and like what to do with someone who's just not getting an epidural. Like some people are just like, I don't know what to do, you know? And so, um, because so I think we're trained to be like, you have to do something, right? Like someone's in pain, you gotta help them, you gotta, and there's ways to help other than um, the use of an epidural sometimes, right? So if someone comes in and says, I don't want an epidural, you know, how are we gonna be, um, best support that person in their, in their birth? And um, doulas usually come with that wealth of information, but I think nurses need to also have that information up their sleeves um, because not everyone's able to get a doula, unfortunately. So I think it's it's on us to be able to also take on that role when needed. But then again, back to what I was saying before, nurses always having to chart and do so much. We're not always at the bedside as much as we'd like to. So having that nurse, that doula in the room who knows all these things is very beneficial. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody else have any other questions or comments for Ala? I'll just 
quickly share my screen. So if anyone wants to reach out. Thank you. Yeah, that's my email. I'm happy to chat. And you can connect with me on Instagram at Queen Amin. <laughs> it's a name that stuck from college. <laughs> And um, these are some other doulas in Connecticut. So if you want to take a screenshot or a picture, these are some amazing doulas that offer, offer. these are, and these are um, black doulas, by the way, but there are so many doulas in the state um, that are offering really great services. And the more and more I, I see them, the more I'm like, oh my gosh, like doula care is expanding. So I'm really glad to see that that's the case. So definitely take advantage. I'll, I took a screen capture of that, but if you could just send me your contact information that you shared, I'll include that in the meeting minutes as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for that thoughtful presentation. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate all of you and your energy and time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, we're moving on to our next presenter. Janelle Posey Green is a licensed clinical social worker, is owner, co owner of Magnolia Wellness in New London, Connecticut. She merges holistic and African Indigenous healing practices with psychotherapy to create a well rounded healing experience. Janelle is a trained trauma and EMDR therapist and specializes in working with women as well as those experience, experiencing race based stress. Janelle also provides training and consultation to professionals looking to expand their knowledge and practice of cultural competency. Janelle is the founder and president of Southeastern Connecticut Naturalistas, an organization created as an online forum to help people of color learn how to care for and embrace their natural hair. Janelle, welcome. Uh, you are presenting to the WISPIC group. We have 57 people on the call right now. We're excited for your presentation. Hi, thank you. I'm very excited to be here and honored. Um, before I even begin, I wanted to acknowledge the presentation before me and how important the messages that were received from that um, presentation. Um, and to uh, let you all know, to kind of build upon that knowledge and understanding of uh, implicit bias and unconscious bias, um, people of color, experience so many different types of microaggressions and underlying racism. So when you're thinking about some of the practices that I talk about today, and hopefully you'll you'll um, do with me because I would love for this to be a interactive uh, demonstration uh, today. Uh, think about utilizing some of these practices with your with your patients, with your clients, okay? Keep that in mind. Um, or with yourself, because being in the medical field, being in any field that you're in the helping field is pretty stressful. So give me a moment. I'm going to share my screen. And as I said before, thank you for having me. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about holistic mental health practices, and then also introduce the CT BIPOC Mental Health and Wellness Initiative. So why do we need to heal? The reason why we're doing any of this, especially when it comes to understanding coping mechanisms um, for many things that are going on in this world that we have going on right now. Um, the number one, specifically for a person of color, um, is white supremacy. We experience racial trauma, intergenerational trauma, colorism, internal racism. There's also systemic oppression, microaggressions, imposter syndrome, superwoman syndrome, harmful stereotypes that have spanned for generations. And at any given point or at all given points, some of the people you work with will be experiencing these things, especially if they come from a marginalized community. It's very important that you keep these things in mind when you're assessing, how do I wanna support this person? How do I wanna help this person that's in front of me? So holistic healing isn't just taking a day at the spa. I wish, right? That would be amazing for most of us if you could afford it all the time. That would be wonderful. However, we have some natural remedies 
just, you know, that don't cost a dime that could support you relaxing yourself or passing on this information for your person that you're working with to relax themselves. Some of it is, uh, you know, doing some, some work within uh, plants and herbs where you're just gardening, or if you don't have a green thumb, buying, <laughs> buying them and allowing yourself to just reap the benefits of someone else's hard work. But, you know, you just keep up the plant if you can. Um, but you can also burn things like sage and frankincense. There are, there is science to back up that certain scents will help support improving your mood if you, if you allow it. It's all about the state of mind, right? And your willingness to want these things to actually work. Um, you know, what we call a spiritual bath or a cleansing, um, cross, the, cross culturally, they're called different things. But basically, it's different herbs that are put into a basin or, or um, a, 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 a jug or some type of bowl. And you put different healing herbs and oils in there and you allow yourself to just relax and bathe or just put, your, put the water over your head with the cooling water, with the herbs to allow yourself to just relax. Or if you don't want herbs in your hair, you can actually put it in one of those little um, sacks that you can get at the Dollar Tree and reap the benefits that way where it's still in the water, but it's allowing you to still smell it. Drinking water also helps. And then there are several herbal teas grounding techniques. You know, it doesn't cost a dime to go out and barefoot in the grass or the sand, going for a walk or hike in nature. Um, the more oxygen you have to your brain, to your body, it helps boost those feel-good hormones, allowing you to ultimately feel a little bit better than you did before you started. Listening to nature sounds. If you can't get out there yourself, then, you know, going on YouTube, pulling up something like waves or winds in the trees, chimes, um, those are also really good ways of kind of getting yourself to just really give yourself a break for a few minutes. And affirmations. Affirmations are powerful. What you say has meaning. It has power. We're going to practice some affirmations shortly. But affirmations, in case you're not familiar what what they are it's it's a term or phrase that you can tell yourself to help you get through whatever you feel might be hard for you in the moment so say um I don't know about the rest of you but paperwork at the end of the day is so hard for me I'm just going to be transparent and real <laughs> you know you you do amazing work with the clients and then now you have all this paperwork to do. So what am I going to tell myself to get myself through this I did a really good job with my clients I need to do a really good job in putting this on paper, or I can do this. I, it takes 10 minutes, you know, whatever you need to tell yourself to kind of cheer yourself on. Um, more things with sound that would also help to kind of help boost your mood or give you some energy. Drumming, you know, drumming is a really cool uh, con uh, concept when you think about it. There is rhythmic drumming that can help give you that energy to do something, anything, like if you want to clean your house, or you can do some rhythmic drumming that will help ease you in and make you relax. Um, meditative drumming is called, like I said before, chimes and sound bowls. I don't know if you guys can see me behind me, my sound bowls. If you've never heard sound bowls, I don't mind giving you guys a little snip snippet about what it what it sounds like um, very relaxing very helpful um, this is that herbal bath that I was telling you about and giving you a little recipe here please try it I'm serious try it and email me let me know so Epsom salt some essential oils herbs dried orange peels um, you're gonna put it in a mesh bag and let it infuse for about 15 minutes and like I said, if you don't want it all up in your 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 uh, tub, like I said, put it in that that mesh bag, or you could just put it in a bowl and and smell just the fumes from the bowl. But either way, it will give you benefits that you will have to be able to relax and let go, even if it's for just ten minutes. Here are some culturally competent um, and inclusive interventions for race-based stress and trauma. Um, Dr. Sheena Young, 
has uh, developed a trauma-informed yoga specifically for uh, BIPOC individuals. Um, there's also comedic yoga. The difference between comedic yoga and the yoga that most of us are familiar with um, that came out of India is the comedic yoga comes from um, uh, ancient Kemet in, in uh, Egypt and Africa, and it's the poses that are on the sides of the pyramid. There's also um, Dr. Joy's uh, generational trauma and implementation models of being able, if you've never heard of Dr. Joy, write her down. She will change your life. I'm so sincerely serious. It doesn't matter what culture you are. The, the, the way she frames understanding generational trauma and how it affects you will allow you to really think about and deep-seated understanding about unconscious bias and how it comes to be that all of us can be in this system where we are seamlessly not able to see some things that are happening in front of us because they've happened for generations and they're just considered normal until you take an outside perspective. So yes, please, if you're not familiar with her, write her down. Um, Sacred Woman by Queen Afua. Um, she is very good about healing the mind, body, and spirit. And um, she actually is womb yoga. There's a uh, womb wellness yoga that you can do with her. There are um, different practices that um, she utilizes to help with specific uh, womb ail ailments. Um, again, there's sound healing, cultural dancing. I, I, when I say cultural dancing, I mean all cultural dancing from line dancing all the way to, you know, doing the salsa, um, playing instruments, there's cognitive um, processing theory, EMDR, and if you work with children, bounce back. So now, if you don't mind, I would love, love, love for you to join me in doing an interactive activity. We're going to do something called EFT tapping. Has anyone ever heard of this before? Yes, I see some shaking heads. Good, great. I have a little story to tell. So I um, did a presentation for um, some uh, people who work in law enforcement. And as you know, working in those types of militant types of uh, environments are super stressful. I'm t teaching them about EFT and they're like, okay, you know, I hear back three months later, that they're actually using it and it's working. So you can see, you're gonna see them going like this, <laughs> but it works. So I want you to um, keep an open mind about some of these practices and follow along. So EFT tapping is also called emotional freedom technique. It's, um, it can help you for moments of emotional distress, uh, and also physical pain for some people. Uh, so what we're going to do, can everyone see me? Well, if not, I can put, make myself, I can make myself the, um, pin myself and stop sharing. Can everyone see me well now? Yes. Wonderful. So I love pairing EFT tapping with affirmations or music. We can do that momentarily. But for now, I want to, if you don't mind, we're going to follow along. First, we're going to start here. If you can Play close attention to your breathing. Allowing yourself to just breathe gently out of your nose, into your nose and out through your mouth as if you're breathing through a straw. We're gonna switch. Switch. Switch again. Switch again. 
last one. Hmm. Now, I give the example of paperwork. Maybe you don't have 20 minutes to go sit outside and soak up some sun, but if you got two minutes or one minute, put on your favorite song, doesn't matter what genre, and do a little bit of EFT tapping. I promise you, it will make a, a difference enough that you'll be able to carry through whatever the rest of you need to do for the rest of that day. The goal isn't always to, let's say you're stressed at about an eight on a scale of zero to 10. The goal isn't always to get down to a zero because that might not always be possible, especially because we all have, you know, really serious jobs that come with some serious consequences if we make some mistakes. So a lot, think about it in terms of, okay, a six or five or four is better than an eight. It's not a zero, meaning you have no stress whatsoever, because that might not be possible, but at least it'll reduce your stress levels enough that you'll be able to carry on the rest of the day. We want to try to move away from that all or nothing thinking. I think um, one of the things that I find the most is a barrier for people to doing some self-care techniques is they believe that if they don't have time to do like this big ceremony, ceremonious um, relaxation retreat, basically, then they don't want to do anything at all. So this will be helpful because you can do smaller things like this and still be able to move out, move on throughout your day. Um, can everyone see the PowerPoint again? Yes, wonderful. All right, so some other techniques that are really supportive of helping you to relax and really getting you back down to some type of homeostasis. As we said before, the belly breathing helps, but so does humming. Think of yourself, but you know, pre-adolescence when you're a child, children hum. They hum, they sing, they do all these natural things that come so naturally to most of us as humans that we forget about as we grow up and we go through things. So humming, you know, it doesn't have to, you don't have to hum this beautiful hymn, just, mm, you know, it allows yourself to just get back into balance enough to move forward. Um, rocking back and forth, slow motion. Uh, you know, if you want to pair that with the humming, that also will help give you a nice relaxation sensation. So you're able to get yourself back to a state where you can work again. And chanting, of course, chanting, especially if it's something that's powerful and, and makes you feel good. So like I said before, we're gonna practice some um, affirmations. I'm gonna grab one of my bowls. And while we do the affirmation, we can listen to some sound music. Huh? Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Okay. So. And repeat after me or you can do it at your own pace, okay? I promise to create the love within myself that I never received in this country, in my family, in my community, in my relationships. Self-love is so good. One more time. I promise to create the love within myself that I never received in this country, in my family, in my community, in my relationships.
So, you know, you could pair that with something on YouTube if you want to, a sound, or just do it by itself. It helps. So progressive muscle relaxation. Has anybody heard of this one? Okay, we're going we're gonna to do it together again, okay? So the reason why this works is because you are tightening up your muscles and it's just uncomfortable enough that your brain is sending hormones to say, okay, there's something going on here. I mean, your brain is sending chemicals saying there's something going on here. So when you finally release, those hormones that make you feel good are also released. So it's helping you feel slightly better than you did before you did the progressive muscle, before you tightened up your muscles. So... What we're gonna do is we're gonna start with our shoulders. We're gonna lift them up to our ears, tight, tight, tight. And release. One more time. And release. Pay attention to your body. If there's any part of it that's saying it's tight, Give it some love and attention. Now we're going to go to our hands. Imagine you have two oranges or lemons in them. And you're going to squeeze as tight as you can. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Now drop them gently next to your body. Remembering to breathe slowly into your nose. And out through your mouth. One more time, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. And release. Yes, that's very helpful, especially if you're tense, stressed, takes like three seconds. It's not something that you have to do any type of setup for or draw attention to yourself. You can always squeeze your um hands underneath your desk or something um another thing i wanted to uh mention is guided imagery it's a form of meditation but you're guided by a speaker um and there you know you can go anywhere i mean and there's tons of them on youtube it helps you my favorite is one called floating on a cloud i absolutely love it, it it's only five minutes and it's enough to kind of let you just be somewhere else for a moment and then come back. So now I'm gonna switch gears for just a moment and just talk about the CT BIPOC Mental Health and Wellness Initiative. I'm also going to give you a list. This list is a document of about 100 different BIPOC uh, mental health professionals and, um, you know, of all different. So we have some coaches, we have um, people who speak uh, Spanish, people who work with children only. But my point is it's, a, it's a, a, a document created to help your clients or whoever you're working with get the support from a BIPOC person if they needed it. The reason I started the, this BIPOC Mental Health Wellness Initiative was originally because of the pandemic. During the pandemic, a lot of different things were going on, a lot of vicarious traumatization from the news, um, people's even lived experiences. So what I did was I reached out to colleagues to find out, can we do some forums to be online forums so people can get the support they need to have that space just to talk about what is going on with them, what they're feeling, and various topics that are important to the BIPOC community. Um, to date, we have done 114 of them. Uh, as you see, there are various topics from addiction, abuse. Uh, uh, we also talk about love, relationships, fatherhood for men of color. There's you know, really a, a wide, and they're all recorded. So if you ever want to go back, please go back. There's a wealth of information on there. The best part for me, I feel like that I really am so proud of us is we are a collaborative of all types of men mental health and physical health 
professionals, whether we have some doulas on board, um, PhD and medical doctors. So everyone really takes pride in doing some research and really coming up with information that everyone could leave with and utilize. And if they don't have the information readily available, then, you know, we take the person's information and then get it to them and it's free. So um, right now we're on break, we'll be back in September, but this is a resource that you could either use yourself or um, tell any of your BIPOC uh, clients or patients if they need resources on many different mental health or physical health issues. Um, my specialty specifically is uh, racial trauma and social justice. So I do a lot of trainings and a lot of workshops on that specific, the, well, those specific issues. If you ever are interested in um, joining the initiative, this is how you reach us. And if you're interested in um, any type of uh, trainings, my next training is coming up. Uh, soon uh, for implicit bias and inclusion in practice. The difference is we're not going to just talk about it on the surface. We're going to talk about how do we practice this. What does this look like in real life? Okay. Um, if you have more questions for me about uh, how do we access the, the initiative, how, Janelle, what was that? Squeeze what again? You could contact me this way. This is my well, my website, as well as my email. And um, I'm very proud that I was able to work with you and excited to um, hopefully hear back that you're using some of these techniques because we all need them. Thank you. Janelle, 